Great. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first of our sessions on Thursday. So I'd also like to welcome our live web audience. It's being web streamed this session. So hello to everyone in the auditorium. Hello to everyone on the web as well. So as an industry, we are blessed in that we have two regulators. But we're genuinely blessed in that we have representatives from both of those regulators on stage today. So we have Leslie and David, who will be talking to us about what's going on at the TPR and the FCA. So Leslie is Chief Executive at the Pensions Regulator. David is Director of Policy at the FCA. And we do actually have some quite exciting breaking news to talk about in this session as well. So there was a press release this morning about the joint strategy between TPR and FCA. So the great news is that Leslie and David will be talking to us about this during the session. So really the plan is that we're going to have some opening remarks, but then it's going to be mainly questions and answers. So please do send in your questions you know, as normal so that I'll receive them on the iPad. And obviously we'll do some raising hands things as well. But just to start off with, um, Leslie, you were going to go first, weren't you, with some opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, and it's really great to be here. Um, and thank you also to the PLSA for, um, uh, for inviting both TPR and FCA to participate in this together. We do appreciate that. Uh, David and I have worked closely for many years. Um, because although each organisation has its own separate remit that's given to us by Parliament, it's really important that people know that we work closely together and this is what our joint strategy for the pensions, which is published today and which David will talk more about in a moment, uh, is designed to deliver an even closer working relationship between the two bodies in the areas of mutual interest in pensions. And we think it's particularly relevant uh, for this to have this because there is so much change going on and because we detect a thirst amongst you, uh, um, our stakeholders, to understand clearly what each of us does, uh, but equally well to understand where we work together. Uh, and the pensions landscape has changed substantially. We heard just in that film uh, about, for example, the impact of automatic enrolment. These major policy initiatives have transformed the way that people save. Economic and political factors impact on the public's mood and motivations to save. Technological developments are changing their expectations. But above all, millions more people are saving, which is a great thing. Uh, these people want access to financial information at their fingertips. They want more transparency. Uh, they want to know they can trust the people who are looking after their savings. So as regulators, we, the FCA and the TPR, have had to adapt to make sure that we are fit for purpose uh, and to make sure that member savings are protected in this evolving landscape. And I have to stress, this means all members, whether they're in a DB scheme, a DC scheme, perhaps one of the big public service schemes, whether it's older savers who are at the decumulation stage, who are facing new and complex decisions, or whether it's newer savers being enrolled for the first time, perhaps into a master trust. And it's why, from our perspective at the pensions regulator, we are emphasizing that we are a clearer, quicker, and tougher regulator. We've had to adapt our approach. Schemes are already feeling the difference in the way that we interact with them. And one key element of this work and our new approach is that we are working more closely with partners such as the FCA. The pension sector faces inevitable uh, changing risks and challenges over the next five to 10 years. And it's important that we tackle these together. And our joint strategy, which is published today, and please, I do appreciate you probably haven't had a chance to read it at nine o'clock in the morning, but I would encourage you to go away and have a look at it later. It sets out how we'll do that. Um, so we will continue to work together to deepen our relationship to address those risks. And David's now going to tell us a little bit more about the strategy. Right, thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, and thank you uh, to Emma and colleagues for inviting us along. 
This feels kind of like we've gone full circle because actually when we kicked off the strategy work, we started with an event in London where Leslie and I shared a stage talking about the pension strategy. Um, and we got, we got a huge amount out of those events. Um, so as Leslie says, I, I, I doubt you've had a chance to read it yet, um, but I would very much commend it to you. It really does set the scene for where we want to go over the next few years. Um, I think one, one of the questions we got asked along the way was, well, why are you coming up with a strategy now? Well, no, why not, I think, is the answer to that in the first instance, actually. We've seen a huge amount of change over the last few years uh, to the landscape as a whole, some of which, which Leslie's outlined. Um, and therefore, actually, we felt it was important to take a step back uh, and just consider, actually, what are the key harms in this market and where should our focuses be? Um, so, so that's what we've done. We can see the effects of those reforms now bedding in across the sectors. Um, and so what we wanted to do was look across the next five to ten years. I think it's also important to put things in context, um, in the context of consumers' broader financial lives. And again, I think that perhaps touches on some of the work that you, you did yesterday. Private pensions are a significant part of consumers' financial lives, and a particular part of their resilience in later life, but it's not the whole story. Um, our financial lives survey from 2017 tells us a number of things, for example. State pensions remain a vital underpin. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone in this room, but 93% of UK individuals aged 65 and over, or someone in their household, receives the state pension, and it represents the main source of income for about half of them. Um, so so the, the picture is still quite, quite marked. Um, we also see 71% of UK individuals aged over 65 own their own home outright. So a pension may not be their only source of income. There are other assets that they can potentially draw on um, or that actually affect their spending patterns if they actually own the home outright as opposed to having to pay rent or continuing with some form of mortgage into retirement. And of course, working lives are changing. So a significant number of people over 65 will still be working in some shape or form. And the rise in state pension age obviously contributes to that. So in our strategy, what we do is we set out what we want our regulatory uh, interactions to achieve. We've looked at our objectives under four specific key areas of focus. And we believe that actually focusing on those, that those areas will help to deliver the over, against the overarching harm uh, of people not achieving adequate income, whether that be adequate to live on or actually what they wanted or expected to have when they reach retirement age. So again, I think that links very much to some of the, the conversations that you've, you've been having yesterday. In terms of our areas of focus, we've broken that down into, as I say, four, four key headings. So firstly, around access and participation. So what we want to see is pension and retirement income products that support people to increase their financial provision for later life. Secondly, we've got funding and investments. We want pensions that are well-funded and invested appropriately. Governance and administration. Pensions that are well-governed, well-run, and deliver value for money. And consumer understanding and decision-making. People should be able to access helpful information, helpful guidance, helpful advice that enables them to make well-informed decisions. So if we, can, if we can focus across all of those, then I think we make a significant contribution to the overall harm of people getting what they expect um, and perhaps what they need in retirement. Now, many of the initiatives that support this work um, are outlined in the strategy, and many of them are already underway within either the pensions regulator or the FCA, or jointly. Uh, we do a number of pieces of joint work already, uh, but I think perhaps one of the reflections that we had going through this is we haven't done enough to tell people about that. Uh, and to actually show that we, we do actually talk to each other um, along the way. This isn't all entirely new. Um, so the, the, pub, the publication, I think, does represent a milestone, and there are some things that we're doing off the back to really strengthen and build on that relationship uh, and take things further forward. Now, the overall volume of work actually reflects the volume of change, um, but it also reflects the fact that we're seeing far more people come into pensions and different types of people come into pensions with, with auto-enrolment, and the pension freedoms have changed the ways that people interact. So our work programs are really designed around that changing landscape. Um, I think it's also important that when we adopt a more integrated approach that we focus on joint objectives. And in the strategy, we've set out a couple of areas where we have new priority for action. The two main ones that are here are around the, looking at the customer journey through pensions. 
So that's going to cover both trust and contract-based pensions through accumulation and decumulation, thinking about how we can best help people to make good decisions. Uh, so, so I think that's critically important. We're going to take stock of the content, timing, language and mode of delivery of messages that are given to consumers. And we're going to look to identify any gaps or areas where things might actually be done better. We're also looking at actually where relevant, setting, enforcing clear standards for delivering value for money. So again, I think that's the theme that seems to have been picked up yesterday. But we'll be looking to develop a framework for assessing value for money across both trust and contract-based schemes, which trustees and IGCs can use to structure their value for money assessments. So that's all I want to say by way of introduction. I would very much commend the document to you. Um, and I'd also like to say thank you to all of those of you who contributed, either at the events that we held, where we got a, a, a genuine richness of feedback that was incredibly helpful, or those who took the time to write in and send us their views as well, because it really has helped us to shape the final document. So uh, thank you, and look forward to your questions. Well, thank you both very much. I mean, I do think it is really exciting that we do have this joint strategy now. I appreciate none of us will have read it yet, but it's there. And so I think some of the questions will probably be around that. Um, actually, Leslie, can I just start with you and pick up on something you said? So TPR becoming clearer, quicker, tougher as a regulator. What's that going to mean in practice, do you think? Uh, well, it's, it's difficult to know where to start, actually, because I could give you numerous examples. But um, essentially what it's about is this being a more proactive, hands-on regulator, uh, so that we can interact with a uh, wider range of schemes that we regulate at the most effective point for that regulation to change behaviour. Now, it's very easy, isn't it, when you talk about clearer, quicker, tougher, to focus on the tougher. It, you know, it, inevitably, it's, it's regulators and enforcement that tend to get the, get the attention. But I would emphasise it is about being clearer and quicker. So, for example, in clearer, we will be looking at the content and presentation of our guidance uh, and the codes and so on. But equally well, we will be looking at how we communicate points we want to make to an individual scheme. So can we make our letters clearer? Uh, can we respond quicker to schemes when they raise a point with us or give us some information, that type of thing? And then, obviously, the other thing we're doing that's, that's key and which people will have heard parts of already is we're redesigning our regulatory model, the day-to-day -day approach we take to regulation. Uh, and the most public example of that that's had perhaps the most attention so far is introducing what we've called one-to-one -one supervision for the highest risk schemes. But that is only a small part of what we're doing. And then there'll be Emma, some of the things you're already aware of that people have been talking to me about ever since I took over this job, which is, you know, use more of your powers. Uh, so that is the enforcement bit. And we have done that. Uh, and we have had a number of cases come through the pipeline where we have used powers for the first time, which is the most, you know, obvious manifest example of the tougher. That's great, Leslie. I, I think you're right. I mean, it's, it's good to focus on the clearer and quicker as well as the tougher, but almost inevitably our minds go to yeah. the, the, the tougher. And you've also spoken about high volume mm -hmm. supervision approaches yeah. for schemes. So what, what does that mean in practice? Sorry, I, I, I'm back no, on no, the no. tougher again, but no, you know, no. should trustees be nervous? What's that actually going to mean? Do you well, think? actually, no, I don't think they should, because I think this is the classic example where we're actually talking about supervisory techniques to change behaviour, not enforcement. So I talked about the one-to-one -one supervision for the highest risk schemes. But then we have to think about how we get more traction with, at the right time, the group of schemes that sit underneath that, the many, the many thousands of other schemes that we regulate, but where it's just not feasible to have a one-to-one -one resource allocated to them. So how do we do that? And this is where these, what we call these high volume regulatory approaches come in. They may not get called that in the longer term. That's the shorthand shorthand at the moment. Um, but essentially what we'll be doing is saying is for identifying an emerging risk or an issue and then tackling that with a group of schemes to see how they respond. And uh, then only using escalating interventions for the ones that either don't respond or don't, uh, can't demonstrate that they're dealing with the issue adequately. Um, and that's learning the lessons, for example, from the approach we've taken to automatic enrolment, you know, where the intensity 
uh, of the intervention increases as people, and I have to say there's very few schemes that, that don't cooperate in the end. But, you know, so, so people certainly shouldn't be frightened. It's actually designed to support the majority of schemes and trustees who want to do the right thing. That's great, Leslie, thank you. Then, David, moving to you. So you mentioned value for money and, and getting some more clarity, some standards perhaps around that. That is something that we are wrestling with as an industry at the moment. You know, there's a number of different definitions that there doesn't seem to be an awful lot of clarity on what it means. And personally, I, I really worry that we end up focusing on charges almost to you know, the exclusion of everything else because charges are so much more easily measurable. Uh, and that seems sort of a, a, a sad result overall. Yes, charges are important, but they're not the whole scope of value for money. So I don't know if you can expand a little bit more on, on that point. So certainly. So um, we haven't done the work yet, so let's be clear, this is a piece of work that we have announced. However, in principle, I, I, I agree with what you've just said. I think um, charges are important. Um, certainly, we've seen um, right across the financial services spectrum, we see a number of fairly egregious examples of where people are charged and it is, it is manifestly unfair and we have taken action where we see it. Um, but value for money is about a lot more than that. Um, what we want is for people to understand what it is they are getting. We want them to understand what it is they are paying for and to be treated fairly along the way. So certainly people shouldn't be um, disadvantaged by paying high charges through obfuscation of that price, for example. Um, but equally, if people are prepared to pay a little bit more for a different service, that is not necessarily a bad thing. I think what we have to recognise, though, is that things like the level of engagement. So it, it is a really complex question. So why do we have a price cap in areas like auto enrolment? Um, because people don't engage is one of the reasons for that. So in terms of any assessment, I think you have to look at um, you have to look at charges, you have to look at the proposition that's being developed, you have to look at what's going into engaging with people and whether some of those, some of those techniques cost money but actually end up in a better result. Um, but equally, we need to make sure that people aren't taken advantage of through that process as well. So it is a complex picture. That's why we'll take the time, we'll do the work properly. It is something that we've heard through the strategy workshops that we've done that people wanted more on. Um, uh, and we agree that would be helpful. Oh, that's great. And we did pull it out in the hitting the target document as well, that if there is more clarity about that, mm. that there's more chance that these standards will be reached. Leslie, did you want to say anything on that point? Well, I think the other way I would illustrate it in, in TPR world is, is the question about um, uh, that trustees need to be asking themselves, perhaps particularly if they're a trustee of a small scheme, um, you know, is it the best thing for their members if they stay in existence as a standalone scheme? Should they be considering some form of consolidation? Equally, in other schemes, there are trustees who are having to operate a whole massive range of benefit structures, for example. Could they get better value for members through some uh, strategic simplification of benefits? That type of thing, which goes much wider than the charges point. Yeah, I, I think that that's great. And, and we would really welcome that because, you know, it, just as a phrase, value for money, you know, it, it doesn't mean all that it should do, I think. So, so I think that will be really helpful for us, for trustees, for IGCs, for everybody, just to have a clearer idea of, you know, some of those standards. I mean, we, we should, I don't think we should, we shouldn't underestimate the fact that charges are important and charges will remain Agreed. important. Agreed, yeah. And even where we have a price cap, what we tend to see is actually schemes operating below the price cap, which, which is good. And in many markets, what we want to see uh, where people do have a choice we, we want to see competition. We want to see competition on a basis that people can understand. And that, to a certain degree, drives price. But again, people need to know what it is that they are comparing against. Um, there's no point in comparing the price of an apple with the price of a pear, for example. You need to know what it is. And that's an overall proposition. But as I say, we shouldn't lose the fact that charges are and will remain important. So perhaps I could switch over onto um, Master Trust for, for you, Leslie. So obviously we're right in the throes of the Master Trust authorization regime. You know, some Master Trusts will exit the market rather than become authorized. Uh, are you comfortable at TPR that that's gonna be an orderly exit process? Well, yes, you're right, Emma. We are in the middle of it in the minute. Excitingly, we opened, for the authorization window opened for Master Trust on the 1st of October and we were ready to receive applications. Uh, which is a terrific achievement and it reflects the fact that we've fought for many years to get that regulatory regime introduced and we're very pleased to have it. 
Um, we are now uh, starting the authorisation process and that will then be followed, which is something people haven't entirely latched onto by an ongoing supervisory regime for master trusts. Um, and uh, it will also not surprise you to know that we, uh, for doing authorisation for the first time at TPR, have been able to draw on the expertise of the FCA and indeed the PRA, both of whom have seconded staff to us to work on authorisation. So we're in good shape for that. But as you say, Emma, inevitably, and I've seen this when I worked at the FCA in terms of introduction of new regulation there, high street firms, mortgage brokers, that type of thing, you get a certain amount of fallout in the market when you extend uh, regulation. In fact, there's a little rule that says between when the law is uh, introduced and when people have to write the authorization check, you, lo you lose at least 25% of your market. Um, and so we'll, we will see some fallout. We have already seen some fallout in the master trust market. Um, now, there are provisions in place to make sure that is done in an orderly fashion. So, for example, from October 2016, um, there haven't been a, master trusts haven't been able to increase the charges and so on to uh, members in order to cover the costs of going out of business. That's just not allowed. The decision to wind up is what's called a triggering event. That triggers our involvement and we are working with master trusts who are choosing to exit the market to ensure that they do so in an orderly fashion. We will continue to do that um, and to work with the rest of the industry as well to ensure that the people that have saved in those master trusts are looked after and that a service is then available to, uh, to their employers. Great. And having worked through some of those papers myself, I can definitely see that there's some FCA influence in there. Absolutely. Some of the sort of fit and proper mm -hmm. yeah, stuff is very much in there. So, it, yeah, already, even in that regime, we can see how well, regulators we, we, are working it, exactly. together. And in that regime, we have consciously drawn on the FCA and PRA fitness and propriety test. What is the point of us reinventing the wheel? What is the point of us introducing a set of different checks or different documents that people have to provide? I totally agree. I only wish you'd been able to accept my FCA documentation rather than me having to fill it in again. Oh, yeah, but sorry about that. Just yeah, a, yeah, just fair, a fair personal challenge. thing. <laughs> right. So I um, haven't had any questions on the iPad yet. I don't know whether it's just because it's early in the morning, people aren't willing to type. But maybe we could um, go to, yes, we do have some questions, thought we might, in the auditorium. So let, let's take some from the floor now. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, we hear about um, tougher regulation, code of behavior. If I can explain where I'm coming from, I'm a voluntary trustee elected by the membership. And it seems to me that the regulator is very uh, concerned about codes of behavior. I mean, it, 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 it's tougher to be um, a trustee than be a, uh, join the Masons. I mean, the, uh, uh, it seems to me there is not uh, a lot of protection for trustees. I'm thinking of a situation, take a, a, a scenario, uh, an imaginary scenario, where a company uh, has an in-house pensions office, and therefore is obliged to pay for the pensions office. So the company uh, can influence the pensions office and the pensions manager, director, because they pay. And then they can exert influence on the trustees. Now, uh, because uh, they control uh, the purse strings of everything. And so it's very easy, hypothetically, for a company to influence the trustees and perhaps mute trustees with, with their own regulations and rules. But I see nothing from the regulator about protection for trustees. And I think, uh, or do you not think, there should be more protection for trustees in dealing uh, in their, with their everyday role rather than the, the regulation, uh, uh, how difficult it is for a trustee that he shouldn't steal, lie, or anything else. It's more important, don't you think, for there to be protection for individual trustees? So, uh, thank you for your question. And I think the first thing that you've illustrated extremely well is how tough the role of a trustee is. Now, the fitness and propriety tests that I was talking about at the moment apply only to people who are uh, trustees or controlling, uh, directing master trusts. They are not being introduced for the whole gamut of trustees. Okay, so let, let me be very clear about that. 
Having said that, what is our role as a regulator to, uh, to work with trustees such as yourself? We are absolutely there to support you and to, uh, for example, stand behind you if you are in funding negotiations with an employer about your DB scheme. Uh, we are engaging on such, in such discussions earlier in the process than we would previously have done. Uh, we are emphasizing more where sometimes we disagree with the stance that the trustees are taking and where we think they need to be uh, tougher with the employer in order to uh, protect the member benefits. And you know, there, I know from talking to people out in the industry that they are experiencing this already. But you've hit on the right point. What we as the regulator have to do, we worry less about the enforcement side of things, although it's popular to talk about it, because the fact is that we, you know, most schemes are not in a position where enforcement is relevant. What people are looking for is effective trustees who govern and administer the schemes well, and where the regulator steps in to support them, for example, in funding discussions, or in securing good quality administration for the scheme, would be another example, you know, DC world, that type of thing. Um, so our work has to be to work closer with trustees or, uh, and to find the most effective ways of intervening as a regulator to support the trustees. That's exactly what it's about. Great. Any other questions out in the auditorium at the moment? Yes, one over here. Thank you. If you could just say your name and where you're from, please. Yeah, yeah that's me. Uh, Rustin Smith. Um, Leslie, just a question for you. You've talked about cost. We've got the charge cap. Um, we've talked about value for money. Within all of that, we haven't really talked about outcomes. And I think actually all three are very different. And I just wondered how you think of framing that and how you would sort of guide and help trustees in thinking about those three. But to me, the important one is optimizing outcomes for members. Yeah. Well, I think... There's so many things that we as the reg regulator can do here. Uh, and, you know, we've been working with you, Rustin, for example, on the simplifying, uh, simplified benefit statements for people so that they actually engage and understand better. But as you say, uh, when it comes, when they, with that understanding will come an expectation about the outcome uh, that they are going to get the reasonable amounts that, uh, that to, uh, to live off in their later life. They, that, that is the expectation. And I think that's the big challenge for us as a regulator because the pensions regulator essentially has been a DB orientated regulator for a number of years. What we see now is a larger number of people saving through DC schemes. Therefore, their, their, their expectations of what their outcome is going to be in retirement is uh, more uncertain, but therefore of far more concern to them once they understand uh, what is going on and they have chosen to engage. So we now have to think about the the, uh, how we can help them understand, but also are trustees um, then behaving in a way which is going to generate a good outcome for uh, their members? Are they optimizing, um, balancing all the things that they need to balance in order to generate as much income as possible at the right level of risk? Um, this is something we are now going to be doing and working on through our supervisory model, which will focus as much upon DC schemes and public service schemes as we have on DB in the past. David, do you want to say anything to, to Rustin's question? No, I, th I mean, I think, I think the, the overarching point about outcomes is, is right. And that's one of the things we focused on in our strategy in particular is looking at outcomes and why we're also doing some work looking at the customer journey as a whole and how that contributes to the outcome. Um, uh, and I agree with Leslie, I think there are, there are a number of factors that go into that. Part of that is around the information that people receive. These are the sort of things we will be looking at. But the overarching harm we identify in the market is that people reach retirement um, with an income that either is not sufficient for them or is, is not what they expected it to be. Uh, and therefore, I think, that's, I think we're, we're, we're aligned in terms of actually wanting to have the right outcome. And I think that's something we all share. Um, it's just a question of, of how we get there. And what we've got is a number of areas to focus on that we've pulled out in the strategy document, which we think will help that. And then there's also a role for other bodies in this as well. We, we saw in the film earlier 
about the, uh, you know, obviously the uh, contribution rates under automatic enrolment, uh, matters of government policy, for example. And then the other thing we're very conscious of is when it comes to the provision of information and help to, um, to, to members uh, and to consumers, we have to work effectively with other partners such as the Pensions Advisory Service, the Money Advice Service and their successor, the Single Financial Guidance Body. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about us as well. There is a, a wider range of bodies too. Yeah, we have the luxury of so many regulators, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, they're not regulators. Not regulators, not regulators, <laughs> not regulators no. Uh, other bodies, indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we have another question over there. Yeah, hi, good morning. Good morning, it's Adrian Boulding from Now Pensions. Um, well done on getting a strategy. I'm excited about reading it this morning. I wonder whether you could tell me how you think the strategy will influence the post-pension freedoms landscape um, I and a good number of others that work in DC look on in horror at what has happened. The purchase of a secure income, otherwise known as an annuity, has fallen to third place in popularity. Leaping into second place has come income drawdown, where the average withdrawal is 8% of the fund per year, and you don't need to be an actuary to realize that fund is going to run out well short of your typical life expectancy drawing at that rate. And in first place in the popularity stakes is draw out all the money and stick it in the building society where it will earn naught point something. Um, so really a bit dire at the moment. Will your strategy help save us in the post-pension freedoms world and how will it do that? Do you want to start? First? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think yes and no is probably my answer to that to a degree, which is the strategy reflects the landscape that we have. So what the strategy is not about is saying pension freedoms, let's, let's do something different. We have to reflect the environment in which we are operating. Um, we have to reflect um, what has happened in that environment, and I, I would recognise many of the effects that you've drawn out. And what we have to do is make sure that the regulatory framework is designed in a way that helps firms to help consumers through that, whether that's through the advice they provide, the information they give, whether it's through wor us working with bodies like the Single Financial Guidance Body and others. So, the strategy will not be something that is going to change social policy. It is something that will reflect the environment that we are in and help to put us, ourselves and hopefully the firms that we regulate and the bodies we work with in a good position to help um, ensure the landscape is appropriate from a regulatory perspective and from a customer perspective. And I think that customer journey piece is absolutely critical. However, um, but this is where I say I, I think that there is, a, there is a caveat to that, which is one of the things we need to be doing is work like the work we've done on financial lives, like the work we've done going out and about talking about the strategy, um, and some of the monitoring work that we've done, some of the data requests we've done, to see what is actually happening on the ground. So nobody really knew what would happen with pension freedoms. We might have all speculated, but we didn't know. Um, what we need to therefore do is actually develop a picture that shows how the market's changing going forward, and share that with relevant bodies who, who may be in a position to make changes if they feel it necessary. But in the meantime, we work with what we have. We will design something that we feel is appropriate to what we have. And actually, in many cases, we found that the regulation doesn't need to change. And in a lot of cases, the work we've done recently has been tweaks to guidance, for example, to help firms operate within the current framework. So um, I think one, one example I might give would be when we look at things like decumulation pathways. Um, if you look at accumulation, it's acceptable for firms to have one default pathway in an accumulation phase, right, say because the objective is common. You're trying to save as much money as possible for when you retire, and actually people don't engage, so they need to have something they can put their money in. With decumulation and drawdown as you, as you pull out, actually people may have a variety of different objectives, and therefore the question we've had to ask ourselves is, A, is a default pathway appropriate? B, if it is appropriate, actually is it a single default pathway? Uh, and C, actually if it's not a single default pathway, actually what, what, what is appropriate and how do we work towards that? So that's some of the work that we are doing, is thinking about those sort of things. Yeah. The only thing I would say is that I think, uh, well, two things. First of all, jointly, what we're aiming at here is driving up confidence in pensions and in pension saving. Mm. That, that is absolutely mm. clearly what the strategy is about and the, and the very clear common area of interest. I think also we just had to be a little bit wary about uh, and really get under the skin of what is happening. And as David said, you know, we, you're, and you said, we, we do see people withdrawing 
pots at the moment, but actually what's the nature of the pot that they're taking in full? In many cases, it's a very small pot. We also hear from Australia about the issue about drawdown, that people aren't drawing enough to live on and they're living too frugally in some cases. And I'm sure any of us who deal with our elderly relatives on a day-to-day -day basis may actually see that, you know. Uh, so I think we do have to be careful to do, to properly dig under the, the, ski, uh, the, the skin and, and really see what is happening. Um, so as not to overreact to, to things initially. Thanks both. No, I think Adrian's question is definitely a good one because you know, we are now seeing people you know, actually act under the pension freedom yeah. regime. So you know, you're right, Leslie, our, our average pot that goes as cash is £9,000. You know, so yeah. actually, you probably should be taking that as cash. That, that, that can't provide you with a long-term income. That makes sense. But of course, we move on a bit through the next generations and these pot sizes do get bigger. That's right. And I was encouraged, David, to hear you say that it's not just one pathway at retirement, because I think I was a little bit worried that some of the suggestions in Retirement Outcomes Review were sort of thinking you would go on an annuity, a drawdown or a cash path, whereas I feel that actually combinations would be better. So, so we haven't landed a final position on yeah. this, but I think that's the sort of thing that people are telling us, and this is the sort of thing we have to reflect on. I think... you know. As I say, when, when you are saving towards retirement, the, the usual objective is to have as much money in retirement uh, as you can. Now, when you get to the point of drawing that down, there may be different objectives around security um, and so on. But, and therefore, actually, what we need to think about is that there, may, there is no single objective at that point. Mm. Um, and therefore, what is the most appropriate way to consider what regulation we design? So um, we haven't finished, um, but these are the sorts of considerations that we have. And I think that needs to be reflective of the environment we are working in um, and we have to take account of the fact that things have changed quite a lot over the last few years so um, in many cases I think as with the work on non-workplace pensions it's very easy to say there's a set of solutions that have been put in place for workplace let's just read them across to non-workplace well actually things might be a little bit different intuitively that may feel right so we have to go carefully into that space yeah i think it will be a space where both regulators will be involved because oh, yeah. you know you can decumulate using your existing master trust you yeah. know or your group personal pension yeah. or retail products so you know there's a whole wide range of options for members now yeah. we can't we can't do it in isolation we have no. to and do the, this and the options available to um people in workplace schemes vary hugely mm. as well you know yes. the, the, just just in terms of what the uh, what the scheme provides mm. so. very good I think we have another question right up at the back there transparency task force two parts to this uh, firstly if we take a step back from the pensions industry specifically and look at the financial system as a whole one of its characteristics is that by and large, many people don't trust it. This isn't a problem just for the UK, it's a, it's a worldwide uh, issue. Uh, the TTF is going to be embarking on a campaign to try to deal with that issue directly, hopefully in conjunction with all interested trade bodies, professional associations and regulators. And I'd just like to first of all ask you what you think of that idea in general. Should there be something to specifically try to address the lack of trust issue. And connected to that, the second point, uh, I think the FCA's duty of care consultation is, from what I know of it, extremely important and directly relevant to the trust issue. Uh, I don't think there are that many people who are as aware of it as they should be. But David, could you perhaps uh, help us all understand a bit more about what that consultation is and why you're doing it? Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I think if I start with the first question, so the key thing for me is that trust has to be earned. Um, and again, I'll come back to some of the points on the, on the video, I think it was that Steve Webb made, actually, which is it's rare you see a headline without the world's word scandal in front of it. And in many ways, that, that's a shame because there is a lot of good work that goes on in the pensions industry and the financial services industry as a whole. And the vast majority of firms are trying to do the, the right thing and are doing the right thing and doing it well. Um, it's the small minorities that hit the headlines. Equally, I think we have to be cognizant that as regulators, 
we need to be weeding out the bad behaviour, we need to be dealing with it, and we need to be seen to be dealing with it. And I think, well, I think most of you would support that, because actually these are the people who are a drag on the industry as a whole, uh, whether from a trust perspective, a financial perspective, or, or whatever else. So um, I, th I, think it, I think there's two aspects to it. So one, is, is there something to be done in terms of actually extolling the virtues of the industry Great. Actually, I think to, to tell people about the good things that go on and encourage people to use financial services to engage, yes, I think that's a good thing. Um, I also think there's, there's something about trust being earned and in many cases there are areas where the industry needs, needs to perform better. And that's something that we all need, we need to focus on. In terms of the duty of care, it's a, it's a discussion paper at the moment, not a formal consultation. So it's something that we are easing into, and it's a question that was asked by our consumer panel, the Financial Services Consumer Panel, uh, which is a statutory body that's set up to uh, advise and challenge uh, the FCA. So we have uh, existing principles under which the industry operates around things like treating customers fairly, that you'll be familiar with. Uh, what the consumer panel has suggested is that maybe that should go further and we should actually put more of a duty on firms to act in the customer's best interests. Um, in the first instance. So what we've done is actually open that up as a discussion and say, okay, you know, what, what would this look like? Is it different? Does it move the dial? Um, you know, what are the different considerations that come in? Uh, and what are the implications of moving that way? So it's, it's a relatively early stages uh, and we certainly haven't drawn any conclusions yet, but it's an important debate in terms of just thinking about, okay, what is, are, are there other ways of getting firms to think about ways of treating their customers in the right way. Uh, and that goes towards building trust. May I come in? I think the other thing that's absolutely vital there is that trust can best be built by the industry itself, mm. which is why initiatives such as the Transparency Task Force are important. It's why the initiative in my uh, neck of the woods, for example, around professional trustees is important. If these things are imposed by the regulator, then by definition that suggests to people that A, there's a big problem, mm. and B, that the industry itself isn't interested much in sorting it out. Mm. So I think that, for example, when it comes to promoting the good work that is going on, the role of the PLSA is absolutely critical as well. Um, because if it's all left to the regulators, that is, that is in, in itself probably not giving the best message, mm. the most effective message. We will do our part together, as we've indicated, in driving up confidence. Um, but there will be times when we have scandals. There will be times when we have to deal with things through tough enforcement and publicise that fact. But equally well, it, it, the, all the opportunities we can take to get across the good messages, and as I've said, the vast major fact that the vast majority of people are trying to do the right thing for their members or their consumers is absolutely vital. Great, thank you. Now we're running out of time. I can see that we've got two questions left. We'll take that one first. Could it be a very quick question, please? Well, Francois Barker from Evershed, Sutherland. A question for Leslie, please, on the master trust regime. Um, do you really think it's possible for a third of the market to exit in a matter of months without there being disorder? And if I can add a part B, Emma, very quickly, we are aware of quite a few schemes that are not master trusts that are inadvertently caught by the legislation. Can you offer any crumbs of comfort as to pragmatic regulation in those cases? So on the orderly exit point, I do believe it's possible because of the pre-engagement that we have done with all the various participants in the market. This work started two years ago to understand what is going on, what their intentions are. And we have a pretty clear view uh, and are working closely with those who have indicated that they intend to leave the market. So I do believe that that is manageable in an orderly fashion. Uh, on the point about the, uh, the eligibility point, that is a matter of law. I don't need to tell you that, Francois, you are a lawyer. <laughs> um, that is a matter of law. Uh, I'm sure those people are being advised by their lawyers as to whether or not they fall within the boundary. Uh, I will tell you, regulation is always pragmatic, but in the end, it's a question of whether you fall within inside the regulatory boundary or not. Uh, and um, I'm sure if there are ones that are on the margin, then the courts will have to take a view on that. Very good. Right, we have one final question then, please, over there. 
Um, Rona Train, hi, Ms. Robertson. It's quite nice to have two regulators on the same stage because um, in TPR world, we have value for members and we have overall value for money. In FCA world, we have value for members. All different terminologies. Um, nowhere in any of the definitions, um, coming back to Rustin's point, are uh, contributions. And that's going to be particularly relevant in master trust schemes. So, for example, if a member pays five and a company pays five, or a member pays five and a company pays ten, which of those schemes offers the best value uh, for that individual member? And how can we take that into account? Because it's not anywhere in any of the value definitions at the moment. So very quick answers, I'm afraid, Leslie and David, on that one. Tough question, though. Um, well, I mean, as, as far as I'm concerned, we're, say we're looking at questions around value for money and what the assessment should be. Uh, we haven't done the work yet. I think these are the sort of useful points we can throw into that. But, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of contributions, it's probably, uh, certainly in the ones you described, it's probably more for Leslie's side. But then the question also has to be about affordability to the employer, yes. which has been uh, um, a question that's... Uh, been really important in the DB space as well, for example. So, you know, how much funding uh, should, can and should an employee, uh, employer be providing for its scheme? So in the end, we also have to have regard, don't we, here to the cost that falls on the employer. So in the end, uh, there will be choices. There will be some employers who are perfectly capable of paying more and choose to do so and see it as part of their role as a responsible employer. There will be others who meet the legal minimum as required by, uh, for example, the automatic enrolment. Uh, regulations. Um, so I think in the end it is then if that choice is left to employers and for example in automatic enrolment world the choice of which scheme is also left to employers then uh, the, the focus on value for money must be particularly about um, what happens to the money once it is invested in the scheme for the members. Uh, and there may be different considerations about the pressures and the, the choices that should be left to employers about what they do or don't provide. Thank you both. Well, as we've run out of time, we'll have to draw the session to a close. Now, Leslie will be in the Learning Hub in the Exhibition Hall at the next break. So if you have more questions for her, you can come and see her there. But in the meantime, thank you all very much for your questions, your participation. Can we thank our speakers in the normal way? Okay, and next...